Hi guys! Hi guys, we're Couch Critics and we're back with another video today. Yes, today we're reviewing The Boy and the Heron by Studio Ghibli. Yeah, and it's the latest Miyazaki movie and it's probably his last one before retiring. I didn't know that. Yeah. And I think that is so sad, but he's also been making movies for a very long mm -hmm. time. So I do understand that, you know, this is going to be the last one. It, in my opinion, it was a great movie. Like it was a good way to end his career. So yeah, The Boy and the Heron. The Boy and the Heron. Before starting, just a quick disclaimer, I'm really sick, so I'm sorry if my voice is weird and if I cough during this video. So it's yeah, fine. it's flu season. It's flu season, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Yeah. So The Boy and the Heron. Um, Basically, it's a movie about a boy who is living in Japan, like mm -hmm. all of the other Ghibli movies, and he lost his mother in the war. And the movie, um, and in through the movie, his dad got remarried, and his father's wife, who we later find out is also the boy's aunt, uh, his mother's sister, gets pregnant again. And then, like all of the other Ghibli movies, the boy goes on an adventure. In my opinion, it was a spiritual adventure. He goes on like uh, this journey to get over his grief i suppose to me this movie was mainly about grief and getting over um losing his mother because the boy also lost his mother in the fire mm -hmm. and he didn't see his mom's body and i it's think true. that's also one of the biggest uh thing that stopped him from grieving and then there was this new thing where he had he was going to have a new sibling and all of this we um awaken this uh, side of him where he wasn't sure of what's happening yeah. so yeah that that's the premise of the movie yeah and um the i feel like the catalyst in this movie things start getting weird when uh, maito i'm sorry if i'm pronouncing his name wrong when maito meets a speaking heron that yeah. leads him to a tower and when he get to that tower he enters this dimension and he's faced with the, this idea of either being content with the path that he's on or exploring other paths and getting a taste of what life could have been like if he chose, if he made other decisions. Yeah, it's basically what everybody faces in life. We're all, all true. often faced with different decisions and every decision we take leads us to a mm. completely different journey and i think that's the beauty of uh, ghibli movies is that we all can relate to them no matter how surreal they are and even if there's talking birds and other dimensions and mm -hmm. all of that it's still we learn a lot from it i wanted to ask you this yeah. this was this your first ghibli movie that you ever watched mm -hmm. okay it was my how, first one how did you think of it like what did you think of it I'm not a fan of hand animated movies. Okay. Uh, I'm more a fan of computer animated movies. I mm -hmm. grew up watching that and I've always just avoided this kind of animation. But it was an amazing experience. I really, really loved it. Yeah. It That's took cool. me back to that childlike state of wonder that you experienced when you were a kid. And, and it was just a beautiful movie to watch overall, the watchery, imagery the fact that this movie doesn't fit into a specific genre the idea that are the mature idea that the movie proposed and that 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 are aimed towards a mature audience rather than kids like mm -hmm. yeah i felt like it was a movie that i could watch as an adult and it wasn't just a movie for for children yeah. it wasn't an insult to like the intelligence of of adult it really it really tried to explore some very dark ideas and yeah i think it's interesting i i love what you said about hand animated movies because i was also surprised when i watched the trailer to see that mm -hmm. the graphics of the movie were similar to the ghibli movies of back in the 90s and it didn't change and I love that. I think it has become a Ghibli signature. And I yeah. love the fact that they didn't try to adapt the animation to the latest technologies because a lot of cartoons, the ones that have been there for a really long time, like, for example, Strawberry Shortcake. I don't know oh, if you I used to watch it. it. Yeah. Her, like the, the character 
like change a lot in terms of design through the years because it's been a, an animated uh, TV show mm-hmm. that's been there for a long time. But with the Ghibli movies, it's always the same. The characters look the same. The drawings are the same. And I, I think it's very, it's very nice to see that even though they didn't really change, people still like them. And they like them because the people who used to watch their movies when they were kids still reminds them of the movies they, they used to watch. And it's like we go back to that mm-hmm. to when we were kids. Is I have a question for you. Is this your favorite Miyazaki movie? Um, Assuming that you watched. No, I watched many ones. of his movies, and no, it's not my favorite. My I have my favorite ones are also some of my favorite movies of mm-hmm. all times. I would okay. have to say it would be Howl's Moving Castle, great movie, and also uh, Kiki's Delivery Service. And I feel mm-hmm. like with uh, Miyazaki's movies, it's uh, it's about the story, like. Because the stories are all so different and are about different characters and their journeys, I would say that How Was Moving Castle and Kiki's Delivery Store mm-hmm. were my favorite because I related to them the most in terms of in terms of story. What do you think the movie tried to teach you? Um, the movie, I think, um, the story and the meaning behind the movie, I think it was about moving on and about grief mm-hmm. and getting over it. Also about yeah about letting go i think okay. because the boy was was really always stuck on not stuck but he after losing his mother it's it showed that it really impacted the boy and even with his uh his aunt who would later become his mother they, mm. she said uh, in the beginning of the movie i'm gonna be your new mother i feel like he had a very uh, he had trouble accepting that, even though he didn't rebel. In, well, he did kind of rebel when yeah. he started having fights with people at school and then he hurt himself and everything. But he didn't He didn't rebel with her. He wasn't defiant or rude or anything. He just had a hard mm-hmm. time accepting her. And I think it was about just learning how to mm-hmm. grieve, learning how to let go, reconnecting with his mother, even though yeah. he lost her, and also learning how to connect with his new um, mother-in-law. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what about you? Um, I definitely agree with everything that you say. I do agree that the main thematic of the movie is grief and the exploration, exploration of grief. Um, this movie reminds me a lot of Everything Everywhere All at Once in the sense that you, you have a protagonist that's that has a taste or an idea of what life could have been like for them if they chose a different path. And and, and the, tr- throughout the entire movie, we try to see if the, the path that they choose, although it's a less glamorous path, it's a difficult path, is, the, is it the right one? And so I feel like in this movie, they try to do the same thing. They try to show Maito what life could have been like with his mom or like in a totally different dimension that has nothing to do with his relative, you know, like uh, when he was with the, I don't know what they're called, like the small little white White things. things. Yeah. Uh, Wada Wada, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, That dimension was wild. But the main idea is to like, to me, Miyazaki is trying to tell you that the path that you're on in life is the right one. It's it's it, there is no other path, and you can spend your entire life wondering what life could have been like, or you could try to make the path that you're on work and make the best out of it. Because your path right now is maybe someone else's, perhaps. So to me, I love that. Yeah. I love that perspective. I didn't think of it that way, but mm-hmm. yeah, it's. I think it's relieving to know that you know where we are is the right place and there's no other I mean as much as we want to think that we are we have choices but it's some sometimes yes we have choices but we have to come in terms with the choices we've made and accept that yeah this this is the right path I also um I have like this weird thought that I want to talk to you about from the research that I did about Miyazaki it seems like it's not the first time that he says that it's his last movie before okay. changing his mind. And this movie, according to him, is very inspired by his own childhood. 
So to me, there is like this specific scene in the movie. Um, it's one of the last scenes where the boy Maito is with his real mom and, and he's telling her to come back with him to his real world. And she's like, no, because I, if I go back with you, I, I would have never had you. So she has to go back to her own world and let him carry on his her leg, legacy and moving on with his life. And I feel like that applies to uh, Miyazaki in a sense of like, he's about to leave. Obviously, I'm, I'm not saying he's going to die, but like he's about to go into a different era in, of his life. And we are the Mahito of the movie. We're supposed to carry on with like his legacy and, 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 and take it outward with us into the world from a movie theater to the world and keep it alive for as much as we can. I don't know how crazy that seems, but like... <laughs> I love that. I love that. And yeah, I just love that. It makes a lot of sense because I started getting into the Ghibli craze like two years ago. It was the mm. first time I understood what Ghibli Studio is. Yeah. And uh, I remember one time I was watching Spirited Away, which is a movie that was filmed in the 90s. And I posted it on my stories and my cousin in Lebanon was watching the same movie at the same time. Mm. And I was just amazed that the movie was filmed 30 years ago. And 30 years later, people are still watching his movies and are still like, still, you know, passionate by it, even though it's an mm -hmm. animated movie. And, but yeah, it's just, yeah, his legacy will go on, even though he's going to stop making movies yeah. and it goes on through us because, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll talk I have about a it. question for you. What do you think is the genre of this movie? I think it's a, uh, I would say it's manga because it's a Japanese anime. But yeah, okay. in terms of story, I would like if we were to put this animated movie in a genre that applies to other movies made with real life people, I would maybe consider it like drama slash thriller because okay. it does have a lot of or fiction even because it has a lot of supernatural um, facts and you know, like supernatural uh, aspects to it. So maybe I would put it there. So what about you? What would you classify it as? To me, it's obviously fiction, but I do have a hard time like trying to put it into a specific genre because it's very horrific at times. And I'm thinking about the scene where he hurt himself. Um, we also have the scene where his mother turns into water. And, yeah. and those are very traumatic, mm -hmm. like dramatizing scenes. <laughs> They're very scary. And... Um, but it's it's also light and can like you do have that comedy effect mm -hmm. from time to time. So there is like this huge contrast that blends reality and fiction and like comedy and horror. And 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 that's the interesting thing about this movie. It's because it, it's it, it's not trying to fit into anything. And the movie can allow itself to do that because it, it's not based on like true characters yeah. and I feel like when it comes to cartoons and animated movies you can go crazy with like the, the main idea of uh, of the movie but like in order for it to work you do have you do need to have a strong silver line and that works and that could be applied to anyone in real life what do you think makes a great animated movie because it's animated, I would say the childlike aspect of it and the moral behind it. And also because it's animated, again, I think what makes it great is the supernatural things. Because with animation, I mean, now maybe less than before because we have such advanced technologies yeah. where with real movies we can make so many effects. But I feel like it stays that with an, with these kind of movies we can, mm -hmm. make, uh, we can make things that we wouldn't do in real life and... The magic behind it, mainly. Yeah, the magic behind it. Okay. What about you? What makes a great animated movie? Um, as I said, it's the silver line. And yeah. It should be something that could be applied to real life. You know, also not adhering to the concept of the chosen one, which we see in almost all animated movies. You have a protagonist that has superpowers. It's a hero. You can't identify to it mm -hmm. as, a, as an adult or as a kid. And it's very toxic because it teaches people that you need to be a superhuman in order to be good and in order to help people and it's a concept that i find extremely unhealthy extremely toxic and that should be removed from all animated movies especially that they're aimed 
towards kids normally and and it's it's not a healthy concept to me so good a good silver lining is crucial and a protagonist that's very flawed but who strives to be a good person so yeah yeah what did you think of the harem of the birds he was scary he, he was really uh, nightmarish at times yeah. trippy um but I, I i can't think of anything besides scary and he's he's the cat- the catalyst to me in this movie in the sense of he's the one who pushes maito into facing his fears and his demons and finally settling into his new life and making the best out of it yeah. so in a sense he was uh, c'est, un, c'est un mal pour un bien as we mm-hmm. say in french mm-hmm. yeah what about you i think he was scary especially when he started having teeth bird with yeah. teeth that's very unsettling for me but yeah i think I, I, I didn't understand his role at first because when the, you know, with the title, The Boy and the Heron, I thought it was going to be a journey of two, like a boy who had a bird as a friend or something like that. And then you understand that, yes, maybe the bird was the boy's friend, but at the same time, he was his enemy, but he wasn't really his enemy. He was everything the boy has buried inside of him, all of the things he didn't like, all of the things that made him struggle. And that that was embodied in the bird. And mm. with the boy facing all of these negative things he had within, he was able to move on and grow and learn to love the heron and mm. then, you know, be able to um, grow again as a person. It's really inter- interesting. I really like your idea and, and the fact that uh, you underlined the fact that in order for him to grow, he had to like the bird and to get along with him and 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 that happened when he faced his fears yeah yeah that's that's great um you know that next week the dubbed version of the movie is coming out and and yeah uh apparently the people who are doing the voices are very famous actors william defoe william defoe christopher christian bale okay florence puke yeah and um my question is do you think the japanese version do you think it will change anything in the way that you experience the movie the fact that we watched it in japanese obviously with subtitles versus watching it in american english yeah i i want to say i was surprised when we first got into the movie theater and and i realized it was in english uh, in japanese because i thought we were watching the dubbed version but um I don't know if it, I think there's a beauty to watching movies in their original languages, yeah. but I've watched the previous movies for Studio Ghibli in English and I've enjoyed them equally as much. So yeah. I don't think it's going to change much. And uh, yeah, I feel like the fact that all of these amazing actors are playing, like are going to be doing the voiceovers, it just really shows how how great the impact of Studio Ghibli is over mm-hmm. the world, like to... To yeah. have these names want to do the um, dubbed version, it's, it's just, it's remarkable. What about you? Would you have rather watched it in Japanese or in English? Definitely in Japanese. Yeah. I feel like there is a huge difference between, just like in normal life as trilingual speakers, mm-hmm. when you speak to someone in their main language, like it's totally a different experience from like switching into a second or a third language. Yeah. Um, there is less magic into the discussion when you when you don't speak someone else's main language so i feel like watching it in japanese even without subtitles would have been a much better experience than watching the translated uh, version of it however i feel like i would have understood so many more things if i watched the english that version of the movie yeah I agree. I do agree with your point because a lot of things get lost in translation, yeah. quite, quite literally. And sometimes when watching translated movies, I sometimes listen to them and I also put the subtitles. And sometimes even the subtitles and the words are mm. completely different, even yeah. though it's the same language at this point, because they're both like the translation. But yeah, it's... Uh, also, I don't know if it ever happened to you, but like, have you ever put on an English movie and you randomly had the French subtitles? 
with the English movie and then you realize that sometimes like some tropes land differently and some comparison are not the same and it's almost like a different discussion. Yeah, yeah, it, it did yeah. happen. Because sometimes people try to translate things word for word and mm -hmm. it just doesn't work. Like it's, it doesn't translate the same. It's true. Yeah. So, okay. I'm, I'm glad you liked watching it in Japanese because I don't know. I was, I think I would have enjoyed it more if I watched it in English. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to ask you, what did you think of, Nat I think her name was Natsuko, like the, the aunt, the mother-in-law, the... Um, I felt like it was kind of disturbing the fact that she was trying so hard to replace the mother, yeah. she, especially when she said to him while he was grieving, I'm going to be your new mom. I mean, that that's extremely disturbing to a young kid. And I don't know why. I almost thought of her as, as the villain of the story because that's just not something that you say to a kid. But I just feel like she's very naive. She's trying to do what's best for him, but like in a very naive way that sometimes that sometimes happens to be inappropriate. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, I think the expression new mom just I don't know. I, I didn't like it either mm -hmm. because I don't think you can replace someone's mom. You can try your best to be someone close to that yeah. person, but not completely replace because then it would mean that the boy would have to forget about his old mother and I think that's not the healthy way to deal with these kind of situations um I didn't I didn't really understood like I understood that she was trying hard to you know help the boy and yeah. she was also pregnant and mm -hmm. there was all of these things happening one moment that really um that I remember and I I wasn't sure I understood if it was real or if it was a dream there was a moment where towards the end of the movie where he was trying uh Mahuto was was it Mahuto Mahito. Mahito. I keep remembering, like, uh, mojitos, a... mojito. Oh my mojito, <laughs> mojito. <laughs> so, mahuto? Mahito. Mahito, okay. I think, I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> no, I think it's mahito, right? Uh, so, mahito, there was a moment where mahito was trying to take her to, you know, the land of life, their actual life back, and she tried to stop him, and she told him, no, go away, I hate you. And she kept saying, I hate you. And I wasn't sure if that's real life or if it's, that's just a dream for Mahito. And if he just had this fear that she actually hated him and that he was going to be replaced by the new baby. Mm. So that that moment, I wasn't sure if it was a dream or if it was real because I don't think she would actually hate him, maybe subconsciously. And like she would, I don't know, she, I don't know. But um that made me think of dreams a lot because mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but sometimes I dream of things. And even though I know that they're not real, if it's like a dream where you had closure with someone or where mm -hmm. something really important happens, it still affects you in real life. And I was wondering if that was the dream that he needed because it showed him that uh, the his aunt hating him was his actual fear. And maybe when he understood that, he was then able to move on. So yeah, yeah. Um, um, obviously, um, not obviously, but uh, according to psychology, dreams are based on your subconscious. Mm -hmm. So you dream of what you fear most of the time. Like as you said, like if you're ever having a fight with a friend, and you want to reconcile with them, you do dream about that almost every night. At mm -hmm. least that what's what happens to me. Um, so I do agree with you when you say that maybe that was his biggest fear and he dreamed of it because that was like that whole scene was between brackets entre parenthèses in the sense of like it didn't help the evolution of the movie and yeah. we quickly went to another scene so yeah to me it was definitely a dream too what's her reason for leaving according to you in the first place that's a very good question i didn't think of it okay let me think out loud um Maybe she was also struggling. I mean, she was pregnant. She was going through a mm -hmm. lot. And she was going to accept that she was going to, you know, have this new baby come into the world. But also, like, she was going to be taking care of another boy. That was her nephew. That was her sister's son. So I think she was leaving because, as well, she was struggling, maybe. She mm -hmm. was, she needed, you know, people walk in, you know, in far forests to meditate, to take a break. And I think deep down... She kind of wanted to get away. She wanted an escape, but she didn't. She didn't. Um, 
she didn't know it so yeah maybe there is that what about you why do you think she she left um i don't think she ever wanted to leave i think she just got lost maybe she went for a walk and got lost because of her naivety but i i can't find a reason for her to leave because she seemed happy in her house with like the grandmas and maito her husband so yeah to me there isn't like a specific reason that's grandiose enough to make her leave her life i don't know if she was happy i don't know i feel like her getting um getting married and having a kid i don't know maybe she was but i feel like it was also uh, a responsibility that she had to Mm. take care of because i feel in different societies i don't know if it applies to japanese society or not but people feel the need to get married and have kids because you know that's the norm so i don't know if for her she wanted to have a baby and she wanted to have all of these responsibilities or whether she just did that because she had to because it mm. was the norm especially that if the movie is based on the directors and the like uh, writers real story maybe then because it's also set back in time mm. that's also another motive maybe okay there here is another theory maybe she wanted to explore what life could have been like in the other dimensions yeah. um, if she didn't choose to to adopt maito and to to have a kid and maybe she had her her own heron yeah that led her to the tower and she had the same story as maito and at the end of the movie she decided that her life was so much better than the, the other paths that could have led to another life that's a good point maybe she also had a uh, you know a some emission in life or something because yeah. mahito when he went there his great un- uh, great grand uncle met him and mm-hmm. uh he told him that oh you have this mission you have to take care of the world whatever yeah. maybe she had another like you said another calling of her own during that journey where do you think they went to because i'm gonna give you my theory and i want to get your opinion on that in my opinion they well they went to the island of the dead they went to see because his mother was there his great uncle was there there were also like people who were not dead but didn't belong there like uh, kiriko i think her name was the Mm -hmm. older lady who was with him at first and then he met her younger uh, her younger self so th- did you get the same understanding because with these ghibli movies i feel like there's people always understand them the way they want to you know mm-hmm. because nothing is really written in stones you can just take whatever you want out of the movie so w- what do you think was that place that other dimension that they went to um that's a great question i don't know i mean i i feel like it, you can't really explain it because in order for the concept of the movie to work, they need to show as many dimensions as they could and they need to be as different as they they can be. And so to me, that was just another dimension where that needed to be explored. But I, I, I don't know how helpful it was for us to see it in order to understand the movie or to help the character development of Maito. Yeah. How, what about you? I think it was I think it was a walk through the past because he did meet his mother mm-hmm. uh, in, whenever she was younger. But I also think it's where I think it, they were because they did say they were down below. They at some point Mahito said that he comes from up above. So if they were below, usually by conventions, below is usually where the dead are, you know? Mm. So I think he did have a walk through the island of death. But what I liked about it is that at some point he came back and there were a lot of birds coming at him. And that was, for some reason, birds were a bad, like, bad symbol in the movie. And when he was downstairs, there were the white things, the warawaras, if I remember correctly. And those were good things. And I think it was a beautiful representation that even amongst the alive, sometimes there's bad aspects. And even amongst the dead, there's good things. And they said that the war wars were about to be like newborns and babies, which brings this idea of reincarnation. And I don't know, these movies always make me question a lot of things spiritually because they always have these whole mm. theories that I don't necessarily believe in. But it's just, it, it gives you 
it's a good meditation it's yeah. it's something good to think about so yeah i love your analogy of this mm-hmm. yeah it's it's very interesting that there is good and bad whether it comes to the living people or the dead and i think that it makes a lot of sense yeah, yeah. Also, why do you think the birds were represented so badly in the movie? I because there were like the colored birds, and I was having trouble seeing them as bad things. You know, same, same. Uh, um, I don't know, because birds. There is a lot of I don't know moments. Yeah, in this there's movie. yeah, because birds usually represent freedom and flying, and I feel like in this movie there were the things holding the characters mm-hmm. back. But maybe since you're saying that they represent freedom, uh, maybe since we're talking about the land of the dead, there is no freedom there. So they're made to be evil. And they do represent freedom in the real world because as, as uh, we saw yesterday when we watched the movie uh, For Les Perroquets. Yeah, or they Parakeets. Call Parakeets. Um, as soon as they go to the real world, they, they turn into cute birds. And as soon as they go to the land of the dead, they're killers. So, yeah, I think it's it's all about this representation of freedom, as you said. Yeah, I yeah. think. Would yeah. you watch the movie again? I would. I watch this, I try, but when I really like them, I try to watch these movies at least two times because I always have trouble understanding them from the first mm-hmm. time. So I would watch it again. I think I would understand it a different way. I would maybe watch it again soon and then watch it a third time in five or ten years because then okay. I think I would understand it completely differently. I think it's also a good movie to watch if someone is grieving because mm-hmm. I think it helps uh, a lot. I don't know. I feel mm-hmm. like people sometimes heal through movies. and Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's always good to know there's certain movies for certain situations out there to watch mm-hmm. when you want to feel better about certain things. I totally agree. Would you watch it again? I would love to watch it again in English um, yeah. because I feel like I would make sense of so many things in the movie. So many things are happening all the time in this movie. It's impossible to, first of all, see everything and watch everything on screen because the, the images are at times so beautiful and grotesque, grotesque at the same time that you can't have an understanding of everything at the same time. So it's it is... I feel crucial to watch it again in order to just truly grasp the concept of this movie fully or as much as you can. Yeah. All right. I think that sums it up for our review for The Boy and the Heron. Thank you so much, guys, for watching. And we'll see you next week. Please like and subscribe and let us know what you thought about this movie. Yeah. See you next time. Bye. Bye.